And the beginning of this module is lesson 9.1. And module 9.1 is <clears throat> solving quadratic equations by using square roots. So that's right there. Solving quadratic equations by taking square roots. But before we get into it, um, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for giving us so much grace, cleansing our souls and our spirits, and making our hearts light. God. Lord, I pray, I ask God that you uh, you help this lesson go really well today. Help me to teach, help the students to learn. Help us to stay engaged and to um, stay alert. Let's have fun. Uh, God, we love you. We trust you, God, and we have faith in all that um, you do. We walk in that faith in you. Um, you know, I was reading something last night, <laughs> and um, you may have noticed that I didn't say in Jesus' name at the end of that prayer. No, maybe? I don't know. Anyhow, um, I was reading something last night in this book, Theology, and obviously I'm not going to like completely change the way I pray after reading like a chapter of a book, but um, one thing when I became, when I came to Christ that kind of confused me a little bit was like, like, you know, Jesus says to us, anything that you pray in my name, you'll be given. And then, like, I would notice a bunch of Christians just being like, in Jesus' name. And I'm like, okay, like, I, I don't know. That just seems, like, not authentic, like, not real. It's like, I'm just going to pray, and if I say in Jesus' name, then, like, it's going to be granted. That doesn't seem to me, and, and it really confused me because it was like, it was like, now that I came to Christ, now every time I talk to God, I have to say in Jesus' name. Like, that doesn't seem like... That doesn't seem real, you know? It just seems like something that people just do. And um, so that actually kind of became a stumbling block for me for a little while in my prayers. Just like feeling like I have to say in Jesus' name, you know? And over time I realized that it's, it's good to say the name of Jesus in your prayer. Um, simply because, like, you know, it just makes it clear, right? Um, but the thing that I read last night, um, it just kind of brought me back to that original sense of confusion in the sense of, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean, when, when we're told to say in Jesus, to, when we're told to pray in his name, in Jesus' name, it doesn't just mean add the name, add the words in Jesus' name to your prayer. It really means more about praying in the spirit of Christ and um, in, in his name. Like, if you do something in, in someone's name, you're basically doing something on their authority, right? It's like if I say to you, like, like, um, you know, Mr. Mills says that this has to be done. I'm basically saying in Mr. Mills' name, this must be done. You understand? And so on Mr. Mills' authority, this must be done. Well, he's a principal. He's got authority, so it's going to be done, right? And so if I'm praying in Jesus' name, in a sense, I'm praying on Jesus' authority and not my own. And in, in a way, that's, that's helping us to remember why it is that we can pray. Because before Christ came, before Jesus died for our sins, you, you couldn't just access God like that. You had to go through the sacrificial system. It was only the high priest that could enter into the Holy of Holies where God was throned and only one day a year, right? But now all of us can enter into that Holy of Holies because it's within us. And we can enter into that Holy Presence um, because of the sacrifice that Christ made. And so when we say in Jesus' name, in a sense, it's not just words that we're saying. It's understanding that it's through the authority that's given to us by Christ. And it's not just our authority, really. It's, it's Jesus' authority that we're praying with. Does that make sense? Yeah, thought I'd share. So, with that being said, um, let's uh, let's do well. So, um, we have lesson nine point one: solving equations by taking square roots. Okay. So, <clears throat> if I ask you, um, square root is four, you would say two. We can put our computers away, guys. If I say the square root of nine, you would say three. If I said the square root of 25, you would say? Five. Uh, good. And thank you. Um, 
the reality is that generally speaking, when we're talking about the square root of something, we're talking about the positive answer, but there's actually another answer. Okay? If I define a square root as um, when I take the square root of something, the result is something that when multiplied by itself, I get that answer, right? Well, the square root of 4 is clearly 2, right? But is there another number that I can multiply by itself to get 4? Is there another number? If I multiply 2 by 2, I get 4, right? Is there another number that I can multiply by itself to get 4? Negative 2, right? Does that make sense? Because negative 2 times negative 2 is also 4. So when I take a square root, there's actually two solutions. There's a positive and a negative solution. Does that make sense to you guys? It's just that generally speaking, if I just ask for the square root of 36, for instance, you just tell me 6. Because generally speaking, when we're asking for a square root, it just means the positive solution. Okay, But there is a positive and a negative solution, and we're going to get into that uh, later on in this lesson. I just wanted to open that door now. But with that being said, uh, before we march into this lesson, we have to learn some properties of radicals. And the first property of radicals that we're going to cover is called the product property. And we know that product means multiplying. So the product property is when we're multiplying two radicals together. Okay. And so if I said to you, the square root of 4 times 9, you'd say to me, oh, I can do that. Well, why? Well, because the square root of 4 times 9 is the same thing. 4 times 9 is 36. And what's the square root of 36? 6. 6, good. But what if I suggested to you that there is another way? What if I suggested to you that instead of doing multiplying them and then doing the square root, that you could actually separate them? And this would become square root of 4 times the square root of 9. Well, that'd be interesting. Uh, let's see if that's accurate. What's the square root of 4? 2. two. What's the square root of 9? 3. three. What's 2 times 3? 6. Whoa. Whoa. Why? Oh, this guy's like freaking out. He's like, I didn't even know this was possible. He became like a bird. I don't know. Like He's like a bird now. And he's got like, he's got like tentacles. And he's actually like, a, he's like an elm tree, actually. He's, right? Anyway, he's freaking out. It's, it's, it's possible. Look, it's as possible as this being a solution. You see? So, anyhow, it's true. It's happened. Um, he's, like, freaking out, right? He's like, this is crazy. I never thought this would be possible. But it is possible. Um, and this is called the product property of radicals, okay? If I've got two things multiplied underneath this uh, radical, I can split them up, okay? Um, and the converse is also true. Um, the converse is also true. If I gave you the square root of 2 times the square root of 8, you might say to me, well, Mr. Meneer, I can't do that because I don't know what the square root of 2 is. I don't know what the square root of 8 is. But with this product property, you can actually figure it out. Why? Well, because the square root of 2 times the square root of 8 is also the square root of 2 times 8. And the square root of 2 times 8 is the square root of 16, which is just 4. You see? So that's pretty cool. And so what is it formally? Um, the formal... Uh, definition the square root of a times b is the square root of a times the square root of b. That's the general um, idea there. Okay, you can go both ways. Yes, sir. Um, was there really like a shorter way to do it? Cause like eight, like eight and two. If you just do eight divided by two and get four. No. Oh. No. Um, okay. So. Four, right. Right. Exactly. Um, so. So. What. What else can we use this for? Um, well, what if I did ask you the square root of 8 and I asked you to simplify it? Well, what we're going to look for in any radical, if I ask to simplify it, is there is, is there a factor that is a, a perfect square? Is there a perfect square that is a factor of 8? What's a perfect square? A perfect square is a number that is... Um, that when you take a square root, you get a whole number. For instance, uh, 25 is a perfect square. 36 is a perfect square. Four, very good. Four is a perfect square. Why? Because it's two times two. So I break this up into, instead of eight, it's the square root of four times two. 
Well, by this product property, that is the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. Well, what's the square root of 4? 2. So this just becomes 2 radical 2. And so when I'm simplifying radicals like this, you might have already done this, but the reason why you're able to do it is because of that product property of radicals. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah? Okay, so that's the product property of radicals. Um, there's also what's called the quotient property of radicals. So for instance, if I did um, the square root of 36 divided by 9, you'd say, well, I can do that. That's just the square root of, well, 36 divided by 9 is 4, so it's the square root of 4, which is 2. Right? So I can do that. That's simple. And then I would suggest to you that there is another way to do it. Just like I could split up a, proper, a product, I can split up a quotient. This becomes the square root of 36 divided by the square root of 9. Square root of 36 is 6. Square root of 9 is 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. What? This guy's got a mustache. He's like, what? He's like, this is crazy. And he's also a centipede. <laughs> anyway, right? He's got a. He's gonna. He's gonna have a fun day. Anyway, he's got a very long. He's got a very long beard. You see? Yes, he's a bearded worm. I know. He's okay. Um. So. Goodbye. All right. So you see. So you see, this is called the quotient property of radicals, okay? And conversely, just like I can split them up, I can put them back together. So if I ask you the square root of 8 divided by the square root of 2, you'd say, I don't know what the square root of 8 is or the square root of 2, um, but you can put them together. So it becomes square root of 8 divided by 2, which equals the square root of 4, which is just 2. You see? Does that make sense to you guys? You understand? So with quotients and products and radicals, I can split them apart or I can put them together. It goes both ways. All right? Um, so with that said, let's take a look at the bottom of page 355, step E. Could you work out all those? I'm not going to do all of them, though. Um, but I'll do this one because it kind of encompasses all of them. OK. So here I have plus or minus the square root of 0 0.27. And it gives you a hint of how you should continue. 0.27 is what divided by 100? 27. 27. Well, that's cool. So I got the square root of 27 divided by 100. Well, by the quotient property of radicals, I can take this quotient and split it apart. So it's plus or minus the square root of 27 divided by the square root of 100. Well, that's cool. Um, because that already starts to help me out here. What's the square root of 100? 10. 10, good. And then remember, whenever I'm simplifying a radical, I want to see if a perfect square is a factor of that radical. Um, are there any perfect squares that are a factor of 27? 9. 9, good. So 9 times 3. And then just like I split apart that quotient, I can split apart this product. And instead of the square root of 9 times 3, it's the square root of 9 times the square root of 3. The 10 stays there. And then the square root of 9 is what class? Three. 3. So 3 times the square root of 3 over 10. And so that's my answer. Plus or minus 3 radical 3 over 10. Any questions on that? OK, so I'm just splitting apart products, splitting apart quotients, um, and using that to simplify. Uh, okay, um, with that, I think it's, it's important that we go through the list of perfect squares. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So here's x and here's x squared. So 1, 2, I guess we could start with 0. 0, whoa. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, might as well go to 16. Okay, 0 squared. 
class, 0 squared, 0, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared, 7 squared, 8 squared, Whoa, 9 squared, 10 squared, 11 squared, 12 squared, oh, 13 squared, oh, 14 squared, 1, 1, 6, 13 is 1, 6, 9, 14 is 1, 96, 1, 6, 9, 1, 9, 6, you see, you just flip them, 15 squared, 225, and the last one, 16 squared, 2, 250, 256, alright, 256, okay, so those are a list of perfect squares that I believe that you should know. Beyond that, this starts to get a little bit more challenging, but anyway. Okay. Got it? Yes, numbers. Praise God. All right. Um, cool. So that's that. This is this. Um, number one on reflect. Explain why radical six, six squared and... Um, radical negative 6 squared have the same value. Let's take a look. If I, you're alright. If I do um, 6 squared, well 6 squared is 36, square root of 36 is 6, so this is 6. Square root negative 6 squared is what class? 36, same deal. Square root of 36 is 6, so there's that plus or minus idea right there. Okay, alright. Now, Solving ax squared minus c equals 0 by using square roots. So here's where we get into it. All right, this is really the bulk of the lesson. All right, so let's say I gave you um, 9x squared um, 9x squared Minus 3 equals 33. Okay? Let's say this is what I gave you. All right? Uh, do I want to do it that way? No, I don't want to do it that way. Sorry. Let's say I gave you x two x squared Oh, I could have done it that way. 2x squared minus 3 equals uh, 29. All right, let's say I give this to you. Yeah, I'm going to use this or something like that. 2x squared minus 3 equals 29. All right? And I told you to factor this. Okay, well, generally speaking, when you're factoring, you have to give one side equal to what? Zero. So what's my first step if I wanted to factor this? Subtract 29 from both sides. Because then you would, if I'm factoring, then I have to do it this way. Okay, so then I get 2x squared minus 32 equals zero, right? Does that make sense? But then when I'm factoring, what's the first thing that I look for once I've got something equal to zero? If there's a common common factor, common factor. Well, what's the common factor of these two? Two. So I pull out the two. I get x squared minus 16 equals zero, right? And then I know since that side's zero that this two just cancels. And I end up with x squared minus 16 equals zero. Yeah? Now, what does this look like, guys? The... Dun, dun, dun. The difference of squares. The difference of squares. So all I have to do is determine what a and b are. So a is x, b is what? Four. four. And so what does this come out to? It comes out to x plus four times x minus four equals zero. And I won't go through the whole process of solving. I know it would be x equals negative four and x equals positive four. And those would be my two solutions. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the old way. That's how we would do it if we had to factor. If I told you you have to factor this, do it, and solve for x. You would do it that way. 
But what I'm going to suggest to you is that there's another way, and that's by taking square roots. Okay? So let's start with the exact same problem, but do a different method. 2x squared minus 3 equals 29. Now, as Mr. Barris um, suggested, and as many of you would intuitively do, if I wasn't asking you to factor it, you wouldn't get the side equal to 0. What would be your first step if I said solve for x? Three you would add sides. 3 to both sides. So much more intuitively, based on your experience, you would add 3 to both sides. And you would end up with 2x squared equals 32. And then what would you do? Divide by 2. Divide by two. Exactly. You would divide both sides by 2. And you'd get... Yes. And now, now what do you do? If I want to get, I got to get rid of that square, right? So what do I do? Square root both sides. But I have to remember the plus or minus. Whenever I take the square root of both sides, I have to remember the plus or minus. Why? Well, because the square root always has a positive and a negative solution. So I end up with plus or minus square root of 16. Well, what's the square root of 16? 4. So in other words, my solutions are x equals negative 4 and x equals positive 4, which is exactly what I got over here. Does that make sense? Okay. So this way it's a little bit more intuitive. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on how we did this, this new method here? Um, now the cool thing is, in this case, you could factor it, <clears throat> but you won't always be able to factor it. You won't always be able to factor it. In that case, you'll have to use square roots. So to exemplify that, let's take a look at example A here. <coughs> so example A is 4, <clears throat> 4x squared minus 5 equals 2. What's my first step if I'm solving for x? Add 5 to both sides. See how this, this comes a little bit more intuitively than factoring? 4x squared equals 7. Now what do I do? Divide by 4. I get x squared equals 7 divided by 4. Okay. And if I went through and did the division, that's 1.75. Okay, Ms. Green, what do I do now? Square root both sides. Good. I take the square root of both sides. And, Christiana, what do I have to remember? I have to do the plus or minus. As soon as I take the square root, I have to get in the habit of doing plus or minus. Now, I end up with x equals plus or minus the square root of 1.75. I don't know what the square root of 1.75 is, so I just keep it as x equals negative square root of 1.75 and po x equals positive square root of 1.75. Okay? And since this number is not a whole number, I wouldn't have been able to factor that easily. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, so I could have only done this by doing the square roots or another method that's similar. Um, but why put square root of 75, 1.75 instead of actually finding it and giving me like something like that? Why would I write this rather than that? Why is this answer better than this answer? Simpler, yeah. What else? What would I have to do at some point or another with this answer? Would I write all those numbers and they go on infinitely? Would I write all of them? What, what would you probably write? Probably 1.323, right? If you were, you'd probably round it. But when you round a number, what do you lose? It begins with an A. Accuracy. When you round a number, you lose accuracy. And since I have to round this number, I lose accuracy. And effectively, this answer would be less accurate than this one. Does that make sense? And now, if you're just trying to figure out how many blocks to like build your Lego house with, you know, like maybe it's fine if you're a little bit inaccurate, but if you're sending 
a rocket ship to Mars, you, you don't want to round. Does that make sense? Yes, sir? Sorry. Um, how are I now? Yes, ma'am? It's much better to use a decimal, okay? It, you, it's not really appropriate to have a fraction inside of a radical, okay? Because usually you have to simplify. So, does that make sense? Okay. Good question, though. Um, okay, so with that being said, go ahead, guys, and do number four and five on the bottom of page 357. Numbers four and five. On the bottom page, you get the and do them using the square root method, please. Guys, and don't be afraid of doing long division. You got to just bust out that old long division skill. It's fine. Just do it. Okay. Number four. First step here, subtract six from both sides. You end up with 3x squared equals 27. Next step is divide by 3. End up with x squared equals 9. Square root both sides, plus or minus. X equals plus or minus 3. Or in other words, X equals negative 3. X equals positive 3. Pretty often I get the question, can I just leave it as X equals plus or minus 3? Uh, technically it's accurate, but the short answer is no. Make sure you always write out the two separate solutions. On any standardized test or something like the SAT, you would, you would never see the answer be like plus or minus like that. It would always be both solutions. 5x squared equals 11. Add 9 to both sides, sorry. Um, divide both sides by 5. x squared equals 11 over 5. We have to, we do our long division here. Does 5 go into 1? No. It goes into 10, 11 twice. Minus 10 is 1. Point zero, bring down the 0. 5 goes into 10 twice. Remember the decimal place. So x squared equals 2.2. Take the square root of both sides. I get x, remember the plus or minus. x equals plus or minus the square root of 2.2, .2, or in other words, x equals negative square root of 2.2, .2, x equals positive right of 2.2. .2. Any questions on how I did that? Okay.
guys, if if you ended up, to kind of go back to Ms. Escobar's question, if you ended up, like, you got 11 over 5, and you're like, you know what, for whatever reason, long division is not my forte, fractions are tough for me, whatever, and you just left it as x equals plus or minus the square root of 11 over 5, you'll lose a point. Because I'm, I'm telling you, you don't want to do it that way. you got to get it at a decimal. You're not going to lose a ton of points, you understand? So, like, don't get stressed out about that, okay? Just, and if you want to work on fractions, you want to work on your long division, because you know it's an area that you need to brush up on, then go for it. Um, any questions? Okay. Is there another soccer game today? Yeah. Cool. Nice. All right. Now, this next example is a little bit different. So example A, here the form is a bit different. I'm, this time I'm not subtracting anything first or dividing. I've got my square root on the outside here, so the first thing that I can do is take the square root of both sides, and remember that plus or minus, to cancel out the square. And I end up with x plus 5 equals plus or minus 6. Okay, square root of 36 is 6. Now, your book does it one way. I don't necessarily have too many qualms with the way your book does it, but what I would suggest is at this point, you have plus or minus. Rather than doing anything else first, you break it into two equations, okay? Because you see you have two solutions, the positive and the negative solution. You see that? Okay, or the positive and negative equation. So you break it into two equations. x plus 5 equals negative 6 and x plus 5 equals positive 6. Why do I suggest you do it this way? Because I believe that this way is going to engender less mistakes. So as soon as you get this, this x plus 5 plus, plus or minus, you break it into these two equations. And then you solve both equations for x. So subtract 5 from both sides. x equals negative 11, x equals 1. That's my solution. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. Good. All right, I'll do one more. Okay. Mr. Britson, what would you suggest is my first step here? Yeah, divide both sides by three. Good. Gabriella, what would you say I do now? Once I have x minus 5 squared equals 6, what will I do now? Very good. Square root of both sides. I have to remember that plus or minus. I get x minus 5 equals plus or minus the square root of 6. Do I know the square root of 6 class? No, I don't know. Um, but once I've got that plus or minus there, I break it into two equations. x minus 5 equals negative radical 6, and x minus 5 equals positive radical 6. And then I solve both equations for x. I get x equals 5 minus radical 6. x equals 5 plus radical 6. Okay? And don't think that, like, it's... It, don't get confused, because you can't combine that. It's a number and a radical. You can't combine it by atom like that. Any questions on that? Okay, go ahead and do number 7 and 8 on the top of page 358, 
is 7 and 8. That primes. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's check it out. First step in this one, divide both sides by 4. I end up with x plus 10 squared equals 6. Next step is take the square root of both sides, plus or minus. Square cancels out. I'm left with x plus 10 equals plus or minus radical 6. Separate them into two equations. x plus 10 equals negative radical 6. x plus 10 equals positive radical 6. Subtract 10 from both sides of both equations. Cancels, cancels. x equals negative 10 minus radical 6. x equals negative 10 plus radical 6. Any questions on that? Yes, ma'am. Whenever I'm taking the square root of both sides. So for instance, if I have x squared equals 9. Well, to solve this, I have to take the square root of both sides, right? Whenever I take the square root of both sides, I have to do plus or minus. This will end up with x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 3, right? Well, why? Well, because if I'm saying x squared equals 9, if I plug 3 in there, I get 3 squared. 3 squared is what? 9. Negative 3 squared is also 9. So both of those are solutions. So whenever I take a square root of both sides, I have to make sure I do plus or minus. Whenever, yeah, whenever I take the square root of both sides, I do plus or minus. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's because of that positive and negative solution. All right, this one. In this case, I immediately square root both sides, plus or minus. I get x minus 9 equals plus or minus. Square root of 64 is 8. Separate into two equations. x minus 9 equals negative 8. x minus 9 equals positive 8. Add 9 to both sides of both equations, and I end up with x equals 1 and x equals 17, and I'm done. Does that make sense? You guys understanding this? A lot of you guys have seen this many times before. Um, the biggest thing is the plus or minus and then separating out the equations. Okay, any questions on that? Yes, yes sir. It's negative 8 plus 9. Right? All right. Now, um, last thing of the day. Um, go ahead and read that example right below here where it says a contractor is building a playground. 
So go ahead and read that. And think about how you might find the answer. It's funny how there are some rooms that are so much colder than others. You guys notice that? Like this room's cold. It's cold. Sometimes it's cold. Usually it's cold. This entrance room fluctuates. I don't think I sometimes get in there. Sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. Mr. Henry's room is just right. It's like Mr. Henry. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Should we wait until this exam looks You'll have some time at the end of class. All right. A contractor is building a fenced-in playground at a daycare. The playground will be rectangular with its width equal to half its length. The total area will be 5,000 square feet. Determine how many feet of fence the contractor will use. Okay, all right. That sounds fun. Let's do it. All right. So there's a guy who's building a, maybe a girl, I don't know, uh, building a fenced-in playground at a daycare. The playground will be rectangular. What should I draw? A rectangle. All right. With its width equal to half its length. All right. So here's the width. Here's the length. I know that the width is equal to half its length, or L over 2. I also know the total area will be 5,000 square feet. Well, that's good. Um, I'm clearly talking about the length and the width here, and I'm talking about the area of a rectangle, so I should probably write down the um, formula for the area of a rectangle. What's the area of a rectangle? Length times width, right? Yeah, okay, good. All right. It says determine how many feet of fencing the contractor will use. Well, if I want to know how many feet of fencing, I probably have to know something about the width and the length, right? So I should probably solve for the width and the length. Does that make sense to you guys? So I have an equation here. Area equals L times W. Um, what should I do with this A equals 5,000 feet? What should I do with that in this equation? What's A? Yeah. And what is A? a what's the area in this case? 5,000. So there you go. Plug it in. 5,000 equals L, but what do I know about W? It's not just any old thing. W equals what? L over 2, right? Well, I can simplify this. It becomes 5,000 equals L times L is L squared over 2. That's cool. I've got an equation, only one un unknown, L, so I can solve. Um, so what's the first step in solving for L? In this equation. What should I do? Multiply by 2 on both sides. I end up with L squared equals 2 times 5,000 is 10,000. Got L squared. So I take the square root of both sides. Why? Um, why should I not do plus or minus in this case? Why am I only interested in the positive solution? It can't be negative. Yeah, length, I'm not going to get the negative length of fence. That's crazy. Right? So just use the positive solution. L equals the square root of 10,000. What's the square root of 10,000? Go ahead and guess. 100. There you go. So L equals 100 feet. Cool. So that's 100. And I know that this is 100 because it's both length. What do I know about the width, though? The width is, if it's L over 2, the width is what? Half length. Yeah, and if the length is 100, it's 50. So there you go. Got the length and the width. How many feet of fencing is he going to use? 
What do I do? Miss Hill, what do I do? What do you think? There you go. 100 plus 50 is 150 plus 100 is 250 plus 50 is 300. Okay, so how many feet of fencing will he use? 300 feet. 300 feet. That is your answer. Damn. All right. Next and final question is what is your homework? Your homework is page 361. Um, Numbers 1 through 16. 361 numbers 1 through 16. Any questions on that? Okay. Very good class.